Floating in splendid isolation in the Bay of Bengal, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, often described as green islands in the marigold sun, constitute one of the most important union territories of the Republic of India. The two groups, separated by the dreaded 10 degree channel, have no common culture. The Nicobar Islands, lying south of the Andamans, consist of 24 islands, of which only 12 were inhabited by Nicobarese before the tsunami. Very little is known about the ancient history of the Nicobar Islands. But like the Andamans, the existence of the Nicobars has been known from the time of Ptolemy. Through centuries, the Nicobar Islands have been often referred to as the land of the naked people by travelers. In Tanjore inscriptions, they are mentioned as Nakkavaram, which translates as land of the naked. The Nicobarese are of Mongoloid origin and their language has its root in the Austroasiatic family. It is not known when exactly they migrated to these islands, but it is believed that they have been living in the archipelago of Nicobar from time immemorial. <laughs> The Nicobar Islands were officially taken over by the British from the Danes in 1869. During the Second World War, between 1942 and 1945, the Japanese forces briefly occupied the Nicobar Islands. The British reoccupied the islands after the Japanese surrendered. and after independence from the British in August 1947, became part of the Indian Republic. The islands have been protected under the protection of Aboriginal Tribes Regulation of 1956 and entry to them are highly regulated. When India's first president, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, visited Nicobar, he asked the islanders what they wanted. But the answer he got was bewildering. They told him that we are happy and do not want anything and we would like to be left free to carry on life according to our ways. The Nicobaris show great pride in their traditions and customs. Theirs is a well-knit society, having no distinction of class and creed. Neither is there any discrimination on the basis of sex. The islands of Nicobar are endowed with long stretches of unpolluted, extremely beautiful, white sandy beaches. The most striking feature of the islands is the rich natural vegetation which covers a varied topography of hills, mountains and valleys with the profusion of the dark mottled green of the omnipresent equatorial rainforest. In some of the islands of the central group there are unique grasslands that spread all over in patches. The unique combination of lush green environment, natural exotic palm fringed beaches and the warm azure seas were once home to the Nicobaris as all the 15 villages in Kar Nicobar were located. The Nicobar camouflages its tsunami destruction behind a veil of stunning natural beauty. Its tree-lined shore borders a frothy blue arc of the Bay of Bengal. Move closer and what lies beyond the facade is a breathtaking wasteland of ruin. Mile after mile 
of what was once picturesque tribal land now lies ravaged by the fury of the tsunami. Blackened trees, flattened villages, damaged houses, and schools. The tsunami had ravaged a culture in a matter of minutes and left the Nicobaris at a crossroad of cultural choices. The tsunami not only destroyed the houses, the plantations and festivity areas, but also the social structures. As of now, no single relic exists that could remind them of their past. All houses, material goods and cultural artifacts are washed away. They appear to be at the crossroads of civilization and are striving hard to cope with modern life. A shy and introverted people, they are not yet ready to break with their age-old customs, but are gradually becoming more modern. Now after the tsunami, all new settlements have been shifted to higher hinterlands. Land, forest and sea form the major economic resources of the Nicobaris. Coconuts are sold in the form of copra. The entire family takes part in the production process which begins with harvesting and husking. Horticulture is the main subsistence activity. Though their traditional food include coconut, pandanus pulp, yam, bananas, etc., they now prefer rice, chapati, pulses and tea to traditional foods. They also eat fish, mutton, beef, pork and chicken. Pandanus is an important food in all their ceremonies and festivals. It is also known as Nicobar breadfruit. Pigs are their most valuable assets and are reared by almost all Nicobaris. It is a symbol of their cultural identity. They are fed with coconut. To feed their pigs, they use pig pens, which is a carved wooden dish. The Nicobaris are good craftsmen and make fair models of most of their larger articles and their traditional huts. Pot making is mastered by women of Taura Islands only. They are expert in cane string basket making. <laughs> Outriggered canoes were used as a mode of transport for easy access to all villages along their coastline. They have three sizes of canoe, the small, 
the medium used for transportation in the nearby sea and fishing, and the larger seafaring canoe which is used for racing and inter-island travel. Traditional Nikobari hut was round in shape, very much like a beehive, raised on stilts, some 8 to 10 feet high from the ground. But they now make rectangular houses. The interior is simple. The wooden beams supporting the roof serve as shelves for keeping household goods. The traditional ladders to enter the huts are carved wooden beams with notches on either side to support the foot during climbing. Jaws of pigs sacrificed during ceremonies are displayed inside the house hung across the entrance just above the trap door. One of the most striking objects in a Nicobari's home is the Kareyu that towers dominantly upon any visitor as one climbs up the ladder of the Nicobari's dwelling. Kareyus are human figures carved out of wood, found mainly in the central and southern Nicobars. These kareus are made posthumously for a good person. The skull of the dead person is placed inside the wooden head and some of his bones are buried inside the chest of the kareyu. This figure is then believed to retain some of the spiritual powers of the dead person that are invoked during ceremonies, festivals and healing rituals. The Nicobars began to attract the attention of missionaries as early as the 17th century onwards. Conversion to Christianity gained momentum only after World War II. And now, almost 90% of the Nicobaris are Christians. During church festivals, elaborate cultural activities are organized to create awareness among youngsters. During these festivals, they regularly attend the church. The Protestants in the Nicobars form part and parcel of the Church of North India. Although converted to Christianity, a few of them have embraced Islam, but they are under their own tribal law. The Nicobaris Muslims are the progeny of the Muslim traders from Minikoy and Gujarat who had married local girls in the past and maintained their affiliation with their Tuhet, Kinem or Mirato. The Nicobaris Muslims follow the Hanafi and Shafi schools of the Sunni sect. They send persons outside the islands to obtain training as ordained priests, Maulvis. They celebrate Eid al-Fitr, Eid, and Eid al-Zuha, Bakrid. Muslims in Nankauri alone prefer marriage alliances with non nicobaris Muslims. Despite their conversion to Christianity and to Islam, animist traditions are still practiced and celebrations of their traditional festivals and celebrations of their new religious ceremonies are now inaugurated by a pastor. They are a secular community. They are Nicobaris first 
and then Christians or Muslims. Rites and festivities are an important part of the Nicobaris. The Ozuri feast is a major social festival. Hachua stick combat is an essential part of an Ozuri celebration. They celebrate these religious festivals with great pomp and show. All the spirit objects in the islands are celebrated in the festival. During the renowned Pig Festival or Panuhonot, dozens of pigs are impressively decorated, hung upside down from bamboo poles and are carried on their shoulders. The festivals consist of various stages like dancing, singing, drinking toddy and feasting all night. The festive house is decorated elaborately. Colorful pieces of cloth are used to decorate the festive house. Folklore is narrated and folk songs are sung on festive occasions. decorate themselves with dancing apparels such as headgears, palm leaves, armlets, waist girdles, ornaments and many other things of the kind. Hutu is the headdress worn by females during feast and ceremonies and dance. <laughs> Not 
Never dance together. I polchu, I in cha chinchu. They generally dance, forming a sort of ring in a group, accompanied by steps, foot tapping, swinging, and swaying their hips, moving rhythmically, accompanied by folk song. There is a leader in a monotonous concerted song and then they step right and left under his or her direction and jump in unison coming down on both heels. and dance steps are called sanuto. It is difficult to detect the intention of the symbolic presentation. In fact, the meaning of sanuto is not clear, but is believed to have been preserved either for the pleasure it gives or as a traditional part of the festival. They move very slowly in an anti-clockwise direction a pattern that changes after every song and saluto. The dancers lay their arms across each other's backs with their hands resting on the next person's shoulder and form a circle. The gestures and complicated tapping of the feet in dancing are called Saralor and Sut. In Nankauri Island, both the sexes together take part in a dance. This dance is called Kimtao Kwita. The dance is performed in the festive house at late night. is more somber and traditional. Towards the morning, the dancing becomes more lively and is performed with faster rhythms. The swing, rhythm, 
and tune of the song and dance can set anybody's feet tapping. The night of dancing is called Hasang Sanun. The art and culture of the Nicobaris are linked to their environment and needs. They love fun and frolic and find recreation in singing and dancing. Folk dance and folk songs occupy greater significance in all their social and religious beliefs and practices. It is an inseparable part of their day-to-day -day routine. The tsunami has taken away their material possession, but not their pride and dignity. The inhabitants have remarkably managed to conserve their culture and their identity. <laughs> Having seen and faced the worst of nature's fury, they are once again back to nature, making life normal. Once again, greeting the shifts of winds that direct their life. The fluttering of the flags will be back. The kanaya will be raised. The crowd will cheer again and the ancestors will be honored like ever. The large canoes are being readied for the jovial competition. Dances will also be held on the occasion of traditional festivals and other religious festivals.